Here we present the classiest stories of cheating and revenge from Reddit. The company Christmas party was in full swing. Well, everyone seems to be having a good time, said the unknown man. Probably so, I replied. He must have sensed my hesitation. Perhaps you are a little constrained. Maybe. I agreed with him. Sorry, he said. I must introduce myself. I'm Thomas Townsend, CEO. We shook hands. I'm Mitch Lawrence. I answered. I don't work here. Gail Lawrence is my wife. Oh, that's why I didn't recognize you. I know all my managers. Gail is a little arrogant. I think that's her dancing with Chris Wainwright, general account manager. Now he was showing off. I half expected him to tell me about the Wainwright children's birthdays or who my wife's favorite movie star was. Yes, Gail calls it circulation and pretends it's a chore, but she actually loves to dance, and I'm not very good at it. I was once a good dancer, but after the divorce, it doesn't bother me much. About. I didn't know what else to say. It's all gone now like water under a bridge, but divorce is the reason why my employees are, shall we say, well behaved. A few years ago, my then wife worked for another large company. I caught her having an affair with her boss. Now my people know that I am against inappropriate behavior, any association with married employees that leads astray, and I fire them. I completely agree, I answered. Although I'm not a monster, some will get too drunk and there will be the usual holiday flirting, but I firmly believe that people can have fun and let their hair down without breaking their marriage vows. But of course that happens sometimes. Invariably, it's the male manager showing off their supposed power over the woman in their department. But the offenders soon realize where true power lies. Nobody likes to be woken up at 513. I slept with my mobile phone under my pillow and looked at it in confusion. The alarm was set for 720. How could I make such a mistake? Then the vague remnants of sleep receded. It was a challenge. Hello. I said quietly. Mitch? I'm listening. Sorry, buddy, you have to get to work as quickly as possible. The system is out of order. But it has to be a call to Cliff. He does not answer. You're next on the list. Lazy bastard. I know. I'll make sure he replaces you on your next duty. I got out of bed. Luckily, Gail hasn't woken up yet. I rushed downstairs and put the kettle on. Then he returned, splashed cold water on his face, combed his hair with his fingers and pulled on some clothes. There was no time to shower. Ten minutes later, I walked out the door carrying a thermos of instant black coffee and a granola bar. Gail's car was blocking the exit. She usually leaves before me in the morning, so blocking my path on our short driveway is no problem for her. I had the opportunity to back up a little and go around her. But she goes crazy when she sees tire tracks on the lawn. So I went back and took her keys off the hook and took her Land Rover Defender out onto the road, then took my BMW out. When I returned to move her car, I noticed something inside. I could open this door a thousand times and never notice anything, but now I saw it. The elastic pocket behind the driver's seat had a slight bulge. Maybe I subconsciously expected something like this. I follow American football on English television and lost my 49ers cap. I opened the back door, hoping to find her, but instead I found a pair of used black panties. I didn't want Gail to know that I had discovered them. So I reversed her car in an arc through the grass and walked back into the driveway as close to the house as I could get. Then he rolled her car forward to its original position, closest to the road. Her panties remained in their hiding place. I checked her tires for grass clippings and they were clean, but then I noticed something else on the tread. A crushed bell. I tore it off and put it in my pocket. There are no blue bells on our lawn. Once her keys were back in the house, I closed our front door and surveyed the scene. It looked like I was back on the green. 
a couple of hours at work and the system was up and running. Brownie glasses for me, a black mark and extra responsibilities for the lazy cliff. I took a long lunch and found a quiet place to consider my options. First, I needed more evidence that Gail had sex in the back seat of her car. Frankly, I couldn't think of any other reason why she would take off her panties there, but it's better to be sure. The only lead so far was her Land Rover Defender, so it might be a good idea to copy her keys. Then I could access it whenever I want. She must have known her CEO's policy, so she probably wouldn't have had sex with a co-worker, but who knows what else could be hidden in the car. I took the bell out of my pocket and it awakened memories in me. I picked bouquets for my mother when I was a child, but by the time I rode my bike home, they were almost withered. I don't think it's allowed to collect them these days. I read somewhere that Britain grows half the bluebells in the world and many of them are nearby in the woods of Loxley. They are not far from us and the flowers will bloom until the end of May. I wonder if that's where Gail's bell came from. Wasn't that where she had a date? It took a long time to get there on foot, but the bell was in the tire. Her job sometimes requires her to visit construction sites. In fact, there is no more off-road there than in the forest, but still there can be rough terrain there too. I left early and stopped at Loxley's on the way home. A nice place. There was a romantic little clearing that went down to the stream. Gail and I made love here several times, back in the days of strict parents and lack of free beds. One day we did it right in the middle of the flowers. This was one of our fastest sessions. It was damn cold in April that year. I smiled, remembering the bell crushed in the valley between her buttocks. Had she brought her lover here to relive those days? I looked at the blue carpet and thought I saw tire tracks, but it might as well have been my imagination. When I got home, the first thing I did was check the laundry basket. Gail's panties were now there, next to her matching black bra and no male spots. Did you drive across the lawn again? Sorry, baby. I got called. Didn't want to wake you up. Oh, I thought so. I took her into town on Saturday lunchtime. We drove in my car so I could secretly take her keys. She met a friend for lunch. They were planning to attend the Riverdance matinee. It was during the last two weeks of its run in our city, and she had long since stopped asking if I wanted to go with her. So she booked a couple of tickets from Trudy. Then they will have dinner and go home by taxi. I was standing in a key shop and taking Defender keys out of a key ring. I studied the rest of them and there was one that I didn't recognize. Can you make a copy of one of these? I asked, holding out the smallest one. No problem, the guy said. Looks like a desk drawer key. This is true, I confirmed and thought. Thanks for the tip. Monday morning I called Gail at work. I'd like to have lunch, I suggested. You are free. Of course, I have a meeting until 12.15. She answered. How about you come here and eat in our dining room? The food is quite tasty. Perfect. I arrived shortly before 12 and said hello to her secretary. Hello, Jane. Oh, hi, Mitch. You came a little early. Gail is still in a meeting. Is it okay if I wait in her office? I'll just get bored watching you file your nails and play with your phone. Insolent bastard. Get out of here. The desk had three drawers on each side of the knee hole. The entire left side was locked. But when I turned the key, I heard a knock of a metal bar. In the bottom, deepest drawer lay a stack of folders marked confidential. I didn't touch them. On average, there was a folding umbrella and sanitary towels, presumably in case of emergencies. But the top drawer was a real gold mine. There were packages of condoms, one of which had been opened. On the one hand, they show that she is taking precautions. This might provide some consolation to the injured party, that is, to me. On the other hand, they also demonstrate premeditation, which is not at all reassuring. Next to them were a cell phone and a credit card, 
and I didn't recognize any of it. Her regular phone has a Hello Kitty sticker on the back. I hate this animal. And Gail only has it to piss me off. There was also a Barclay card here. Our regular cards are MasterCard. We don't even work for Barclays. I quickly took a photo of the open box, and after playing with it for 10 minutes or so, I examined the burner phone. There were only three contacts, named B, D, and H, B was Barclays Bank, where she seemed to have an online account, which I knew nothing about. It showed a payment to the Hillside Hotel in Leicester. Then it would be N, D turned out to be Don. Now I have a name. I called the hotel and asked them to confirm the dates and names on the booking using the Barclay card number I read out. This must be Mr. and Mrs. Di Lawrence, next Thursday the 18th, for one night. Is this correct, sir? Absolutely, I just had to check. Before putting my phone away, I checked under the photo's icon. There were three short films. One was of the very spot where Gail and I had made love many years ago. She was completely naked and lying on her back, surrounded by flowers. There was no sound, but she was clearly laughing. The second one was focused on Gail having sex. In the video, the cameraman was sitting in the back seat of her defender. The third was from the same place. They enjoyed first depraved and then dirty sex. She looked like a cheap slut. Either Don took them from her secret phone or, more likely, he took them from his own and sent them to her. I quickly sent them to my phone, returned everything to its place, and locked the drawers again. Fifteen minutes later, we were having dinner in Gail's dining room. Does your company still have that old-fashioned executive desk? I asked her. Seems like it, doesn't it? She answered. But this is unofficial. Anyone can sit anywhere, but human nature forces us to sit with our friends. Most lower-level managers wouldn't want their managers sitting at the same table with them. Then they wouldn't be able to complain about them. So who else is sitting at our table? There are a couple more managers and Sally, the head of my team. Jane is there with the other secretaries, but sometimes she sits with me. It's more informal than it seems. I found myself looking around and wondering if Don was nearby, her colleagues, or maybe he was one of the directors at the big table. I, of course, recognized Thomas Townsend and a few others from the Christmas party. But I didn't know any other names. Any trips coming up soon? Funny, you should ask. Next Thursday I am due to go and visit the site of a new office building in Leicester. They were really scared. Ever heard of concrete cancer? Vague. Well, the foreman called an expert. I have to witness his tests and sign the corrected documents. I won't understand everything he does, but responsibility for the end result falls on him. They only want my signature because I was the one who turned down the original job. That sounds exciting, I said. Not at all. It's about as exciting as watching concrete being mixed. Most of the time I will have nothing to do, but they don't finish until mid-Friday morning. Then I'll go straight home and be back by lunchtime. When I returned to work, I called Mr. Townsend. Of course, I contacted his assistant. Could I make an appointment with Mr. Townsend, please? Soon, I don't care when or where. How can I tell who wants to see him? Tell him it's Mitch Lawrence, and I want to talk about what he and I talked about at your Christmas party. Of course. Could you leave me your phone number, please? I'll call you back. He called me an hour later. I shared my suspicions with him. I'll get straight to the point, said Mr. Lawrence. Do you have proof of what we discussed? Yes, sure. Then I suggest we no longer discuss this topic on the phone. Tell me where you'd like to meet tonight and I'll be there. The Farrier Restaurant, 630. Great. And could you check with your HR department before we meet? Find out the names of all employees who have recently booked Thursday the 18th and Friday the 19th as days off. I'll do it. We met in restaurant The Farrier. What will you drink? 
He asked. I'd like a pint of dry, yummy jack cider, please, Thomas. I answered. Oh, real cider. It's right up my alley. I'll do the same, but call me Tom. We were sitting. The pub was quite early on a Monday evening. I know there is an expression. You start and I will continue. And who will start first? He asked. You can start, Tom. I think I need to say more. He smiled. You're right. There's not much I can say. I guessed why you asked about these dates because that's when Gail will be in Leicester on business. There are only two employees on leave after the 18th and 19th. One of them is the director of marketing, and I know for sure that he is going on vacation to Hawaii. The other is Don Venables, new to Gail's department. I have a photo of him, if that helps. He handed me a standard head and shoulders shot. Thank you. I discovered that Gail had an extension phone. It has a picture of Don on it, although I doubt we'll recognize him from these pictures. I showed him two films where he has sex with my wife. There seemed no need to show her prostate among the bells. Hmm, he frowned. I was surprised she booked her own hotel room in Leicester. Oh, we don't use company credit cards, although now I see that this is a loophole that makes it easier to act carelessly. I showed him a photo of Gail's desk drawer. Her desk, I assume. Yes. Do you know how old this Don is? According to our file, he is 19. Do you intend to divorce her? Yes, I will do that, but I will be forced to pay child support if she loses her job. I need your help. I'll do the best I can. At 8 in the morning that day, I was sitting in Thomas's large office. Did she leave on time? He asked. Yes, she left early for the airport. I had planned to disable her car and drive her myself, but that would have made things too complicated. In the end, I didn't need copies of her car keys, although a trip to a key-cutting shop did pay off. Okay, did you manage to carry out the sabotage? Yes, I found a spare phone in her travel bag while she was in the shower. I didn't want her to notice anything was wrong in case she needed a last-minute check, so I took the battery out. Then I did the same with her regular phone. Perfect, he said. From East Midlands Airport, she will take a taxi straight to Leicester. Not having a working cell phone may be a concern if she does find out about it, but it should not affect her ability to do her job. Okay, Thomas said. For my part, I have instructed the site foreman to introduce her to the main players and then send her to the hotel for lunch. Her main tasks begin this afternoon. The hotel management has agreed to let her into her room as soon as she gets there. They will give her a message that she should call you on your mobile at exactly one o'clock. They will give her your number in case she forgot it. I suggest you turn off your phone until then. Good move. My number will be saved in her contacts, which she will not be able to access. I also had time to slip a couple of private messages into her bag. Oh, that's interesting. Tell me. Certainly, I answered. There is nothing personal about them. I removed all her underwear, although she will have to find another partner when Don doesn't show up. And I left half a dozen printed styles from the films I showed you. She'll get a message. I didn't think it necessary to mention that each photo also showed a bell pressed against it. So, short of talking to young Venables, we're all set. He'll be here soon. Did you want to see me, sir? Yes, Don. Have a seat, said the CEO. Sorry for interfering with your vacation, but I needed you specifically. Did you have anything planned? Actually, as we speak, I'm late for the train, sir. But I can catch something later. That's right. So, this gentleman is Mitch Lawrence. Don nodded at me, and the color drained from his face. And you can assume that everything he tells you to do has my blessing. Refuse, and you will be fired immediately without reference, he swallowed. 
You will come with me to my house, I said, where I have delivered a dozen large flat moving boxes. You will help me pack my wife's things in them and tie them with tape. I have intimate photographs of you, and you will place them one at a time on the top item inside each box before it is sealed. The guys from the removal department arrive at 11.30 to take it all for storage, then I'll take you back here. If you keep a low profile, Mr. Townsend might let you keep your job. Okay, I'm really sorry. I agree with you on this, I said. Now shut up from now on. I intended to place the crushed bell on top of each photo, but I didn't need to share it with any of them. If Mr. Lawrence is satisfied, said Tom, you will start again with a three-month trial period. Mrs. Lawrence will no longer be your boss. He nodded. At noon, I had lunch again in the staff cafeteria, this time at the management table. I got surprised looks from a few people who knew me, but who cared. Back in Tom's office, I turned on my phone at one minute past two. There were two missed calls recently, supposedly from her hotel room. It rang again. I can guess what it is, she began. So you've already unpacked your things? Yes. Well, I collected all your things from the house, and they are in storage. They are awaiting your instructions as to where to send them. Idiot, you will be crushed in the divorce. I don't think so, Gail. You can come and check what you have left tomorrow, but then leave. Wait while I give the phone to my buddy Tom. You're on speakerphone. What? Mrs. Lawrence, this is Mr. Townsend speaking. I borrowed your husband's phone number. Do you understand me? Yes, Mr. Townsend. Fine. I've seen photographic evidence of your adultery, and that's more than I need to fire you. However, your husband asked me to make you an alternative proposal. Tomorrow, you return from your trip to Leicester and clear your desk. You will report to our Aberdeen branch on Monday morning. I suggest you go there by train on Sunday. We will reimburse you for one week of hotel stay. After that, you are on your own. You understand? Yes, Mr. Townsend. I fully understand that it is unusual to hear the terms of a divorce from your CEO, but here they are. No maintenance payments and one-third of the value of the family home. Mr. Lawrence has promised to put it up for sale as soon as possible. Agree to this, and you can keep your job at the same pay level. If you don't agree, you will be fired without references. Decide now. A short pause. I agree. On the way home, I stopped in Loxley Woods, but I didn't pick a single bell.